Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Cliff Frawa, and uh, I am from Jemez Pueblo, New Mexico. And um, I am a sculptor. I assume most of you folks know uh, who I am. Um, I come from a family of potters. My, uh, <clears throat> my mother is Juanita Frawa. Uh, she's been uh, doing pottery all her life. And, and then within uh, my mother's family, there's... Uh, <clears throat> There's uh, 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 six generations of potters, starting from my great-grandmother, who's from uh, Zia Pueblo. <clears throat> uh, her name was uh, Benina Shehey, and then she married uh, uh, my great-grandfather, whose uh, name is Ramon uh, Magdalena. <clears throat> and then uh, my grandmother, uh, it's Rita Casquito, and uh, and then um, and then of course my mother um, has jeez uh, I think something like seven sisters and and two three brothers so it's a big family uh, but I remember uh, returning home from uh, San Francisco because that's where I grew up and. Uh, and uh, returning back to New Mexico, to Jemez Pueblo, and, and finding, you know, the, the family um, all together, sitting around the table, uh, creating uh, pottery. So uh, uh, I was fortunate to be able to just sit there and watch the process, and, and everybody just, you know, being just one family and, and um, talking and sharing stories and and uh, it, it was quite um, it was quite nice, because being out there in San Francisco, um, <clears throat> we you know we only uh, uh, kept to ourselves or or with our fan uh, our friends, and uh, it was nice to kind of come back and be with the uh, extended family. But I um, uh, I did uh, graduate from high school there and in San Francisco. And after graduation, then we uh, moved back to Tehama's Pueblo, and uh, I attended the Institute of American Indian Arts that following uh, uh, fall, and uh, <clears throat> I, I attended school to uh, study painting because I was more of a painter than I was a, a potter or anything else. And uh, during my second year at IIA, I. Uh, <clears throat> uh, took up three-dimensional arts, and sculpture was one of the classes that I uh, uh, chose. And, um, and I was fortunate enough to have uh, uh, Alan Hauser as, uh, as a teacher. So, uh, so it, was, it was nice. I mean, he, he, uh, he, uh, saw the, um, <clears throat> he saw the passion I had in, in stone, and uh, he felt that... Um, he felt that I uh, was serious enough about the, uh, the the material that he gave me the studio key and told me anytime you want to work, you know, you're welcome to come in the studio and, and uh, do whatever you like. So uh, I, I felt really um, honored that he gave me that trust and, um, and, and going into the studio and working on my own. Uh, but after I left IIA, then of course I started um, that thing called life, you know. And, and uh, two things did occur that year. One was sculpture found me, or I found sculpture, and the other was my son was born. So those were two life-changing events that happened. So uh, I um, I started out uh, with a lot of influence of uh, of Mr. Mr. Hauser. And uh, when I left school, I just continued uh, carving. And um, <clears throat> there was just a group of, a small group of uh, native sculptors in Santa Fe at that time. <coughs> and uh, <clears throat> this was uh, in the mid 70s. Uh, and so I would come up to Santa Fe and, and, and bond with, these, uh, with this small group. And we would just talk shop whenever we got together, and <clears throat> and we would share uh, techniques or ideas, and 
it, it was kind of nice. It, it was just really small. The, the likes of Gordon uh, Van Wert. Um, <clears throat> there's also Dennis Christie, uh, uh, Dennis Williams, uh, and and uh, we would get together. Sometimes we run into Doug Hyde and and um, and we would just talk shop. And it was nice. Um, but eventually we all separated and went our own ways. And I, I stayed at the Pueblo and uh, just continued doing my sculptures. Uh, and, and so uh, I wrote primarily in alabaster at that time. Uh, I wasn't really quite at that carving of marble. But back in the mid 80s, I would have. I was able to uh, uh, visit Italy and uh, attended a, a stone sculpture workshop uh, at that time. And that's when I acquired the knowledge on how to carve marble efficiently. And uh, it, was just, uh, it was just exciting because uh, some of the tools that we were used prior to my visit to Italy uh, were just items that that some of us sculptors would say, well, try this, try that. And, uh, and then um, some of the uh, attachment to those tools were um, kind of uh, hard to find. But in Italy, they had, they had everything there. And so I, I was able to purchase a lot of the tools and the attachments. And, um, and a lot of those attachments were uh, <clears throat> diamond uh, uh, embedded um, tips and edges and, and the use of carbide. So that really helped in, in carbon stone. Um, and during that time, I, um, I, I met other sculptors from around the world. And it was just so fascinating seeing some of the ideals that um, some of these uh, sculptors were working on. And there was two, two artists there. One was from, uh, I think it was from Korea, and then the other was, uh, was an American sculptor. And they, um, <clears throat> they uh, uh, were doing this technique that I, I found fascinating, and there was a, a technique of lamination. Now on the screen here, this is one sample of the lamination that I'm doing. Um, so the term uh, laminate, uh, most of us uh, sort of use that uh, for like whenever you want to put a protective coating on your documents or maybe, you know, uh, your countertop has laminate or whatever. But in the dictionary, uh, it's a verb which means to separate or split into thin layers or two to form metal into a thin plate as by beating or rolling. Uh, three, and this is the important part, to construct from layer of material bonded together. And that's, that's the definition that I use for uh, the laminations that I do. The process of lamination uh, basically is uh, the use of the different materials and putting them, putting them to, together to create a, a one uh, final piece. And so I, I uh, the first process is selection, and it's just choosing the stone. And what I have to do is I have to um, cut the stone so that I can make a, a flat surface uh, so that when I laminate the pieces together, uh, the seams will be real thin. Um, as you can see here, I, um, it, it helps when I could get stones that have already been milled, that's already been cut, and, and, and that helps as far as like getting a pretty tight um, seam. And in addition to uh, flattening, I also have to drill them. Uh, as you can see, some drill holes, and I insert pins, and so that I, I put the stones together uh, with the use of uh, with a uh, Poxy, stone poxy. And uh, this piece here is uh, roughly about, uh, about almost six feet tall. Uh, but 
here's another sample of a, of a, a lamination. But with the, uh, the lamination, I, uh, uh, I want to ensure that it's permanent and that it, uh, um, and that it's uh, pleasing to the eye because lamination allows me to play with both uh, color as well as uh, dimensions. Um, with, uh, with the laminations, um, I can create items such as this. This is sort of like a, uh, what do they call them? Um, uh, those uh, markers when you're on the trail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so anyway, I, I, uh, I had a bunch of scraps, so I thought, well, you know, let's play with it. And this is what I, uh, this is what I came up with. And uh, here's another lamination uh, where I incorporate uh, a more vertical uh, um, uh, construction as well as, as horizontal. Um, and then with the black uh, marking down below, it's just actually uh, epoxy fill uh, that's been uh, colored. And uh, See, with, uh, with laminations, you could uh, add the stones to, together to create, uh, you know, a, a different dimension. With this lamination, I actually uh, hollowed the, uh, the, the pot uh, prior to epoxy them together. So the bottom portion is really actually hollow. And then I had to create a donut with the middle band and then, uh, and then another donut uh, for the top band. And once I did that, completed that, then I laminated the, all three pieces together. And once the lamination or the epoxy cured, then I went ahead and uh, um, uh, uh, smoothed out the interior and uh, then proceeded to, um, to carve and uh, polish the, the exterior. With laminating stones together, you can you can create uh, please. I mean colors. You can work colors together to please the eye. This is one of my favorite. You know, and I don't have too many favorites because when people ask me what's my favorite stone, I have to reply that you know it's like asking me, you know, who's my favorite child. And uh, so, uh, but there are some pieces that really. Uh, you get attached to, and this was one of them simply because of the color. The stones just, um, the color of the stones work really well together. Uh, and I use marble from all over the world. Uh, the pink is uh, Portuguese marble. The, uh, the, the darker pink is uh, Tennessee marble. We have uh, Spanish marble that's for the uh, tablita. The darker one is uh, is the marble from India, so it uh, it, uh, it it allows me to play with colors, and uh, uh, I, you know I like to coordinate the colors and and uh, give it a nice soft uh, tone to it. Here's a, here's another that uh, I created uh, with the use of Italian marble and Mongolian marble as well as uh, Spanish and and Portuguese marble. And so, um, uh, as you can see, it, you can create um, uh, images with, with, with the use of the various uh, colors. And the inspiration actually came from um, uh, the works of Charles Loloma, um, the works of Dwayne uh, Mactama, uh, also from the uh, Zuni fetish carvers. Uh, if, if you um, look at some of those items from, from Zuni, you can see some laminations. And after I left IAIA, uh, I, I, uh, I was struggling to uh, have, uh, generate an income from my sculptures. Uh, but of course, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was tough, it was hard. 
So I uh, found work down in Albuquerque for this company that produced a fetish necklace. They would hire, hire native uh, people to carve these small animal fetishes and then, uh, then we would um, drill them, polish them, and then have them strung up and, and, and made into fetish necklaces. And, uh, and some, uh, some of the lines, we would actually laminate uh, the pieces together. <clears throat> and, uh, and so I did lamination back then, but on a really small scale. And I, didn't, I never knew that that would ever uh, play into my, um, my sculptures until, you know, until when I started doing it, then I thought about what I used to do back then. But um, anyway, um, the laminations you can see in, even in, uh, in some of the ancestral jewelry, um, you know, and you see some of the jewelry that's produced nowadays. Uh, so this is sort of like an extension from that, uh, sort of an influence. And so um, uh, the technique is actually quite ancient, and, uh, but I'm doing it in a more contemporary form. Now this is the piece that's here in the museum. And uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's part lamination and part construction. Um, the bear is lamination. The, the, the lid that it sits on is lamination as well as the base. Now the construction part is actually putting it all together and also creating the box out of granite and, and, um, and, and epoxying that together to, uh, to create this, this, this piece. Um, I, um, I, I do have to cut uh, using diamond wheels um, and so I, I would use tile cutters uh, to create some of those uh, more um, uh, flat uh, edges and, uh, and then I would also use pins pins to, uh, to put the the pieces together permanently. Uh, I've also incorporated turquoise as well as uh, parrot feathers, which was once again uh, uh, a technique that you, that was used by the ancestors and and still being used throughout the the, uh, the years after that. I mean, even to the present day. So with, with the use of the parrot feather and turquoise, uh, that those were used to. Um, um, to summon the rains, parrot feathers uh, represent humidity and uh, and warmth, because that's where the parrots uh, originally come from. And the turquoise, of course, is the color of the sky. And uh, and so, uh, when I use lamination, I like to be able to create um, images and try to put it all together, piece them all together to create just one. One, one sculpture. So with my piece, here's another sample. Um, and this one was a little, little bit larger than the, the, the first one, but it's still in the same, uh, in the same uh, technique, just different uh, marbles. This is my contribution to the family tradition. You know, my mother says, there's an easier way to do pottery. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, I just want to try something different because, you know, one of one of the uh, reasons why I started doing lamination was because my sculptures were starting to get lost in the mix. What I mean is that there, there, there has been an increase of uh, of native sculptors, and they sort of you know, play off each other. They, they're influenced by each other and, and sometimes people get confused as to who did what. And, and you know, some, some, some people come to me and say, oh, I think we have one of your pieces and it turns out to be somebody else's. You know, so I wanted to step outside of that. I wanted to get outside of that realm and create sculptures that was... Uh, 
truly my own style. And that's where I came up with the, the, the lamination technique. And, um, and so that kind of like floored the other sculptors, you know, as they, they uh, asked me questions about how do I laminate, you know. And, and for me, I'm always open to sharing ideals and techniques. I don't like to, to close my door and, and keep it a secret because the reason why is that by sharing, you actually help the culture progress so that when people, uh, when other uh, artists learn the technique, they can eventually develop their own and then it makes our art become even more sophisticated. So that's, that's the reason why I, I, I share. And so I've seen other artists doing lamination, but they haven't gone beyond just a you know, three-color stack uh, because they find that it's hard. It, it's a very difficult te technique, actually, especially when you don't have the big uh, power equipment that some of these um, quarries and, and uh, uh, stone yards have. A lot of this I do by hand. You know, I, I just have a, I just have a, uh, a small angle grinder with a diamond wheel, and I cut. Then I have to grind down the surface to make it really flat, and, and so I've got to piece them together and look in between the seams to see the uh, uh, see if there's any gaps. And if there is gaps, then I have to grind the, those areas where it would help to to. Uh, to make the, the gap much tighter. So it, 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 it's a pretty tedious process and sometimes it's really frustrating. Uh, and, and, um, and also when you have to drill, you gotta make sure your drill holes are, are in the right spot so that you can be able to, to uh, put your uh, pieces together, especially when you're working on a very large scale. And, with the photograph of the the larger piece that I showed you earlier, I actually had to use a um, uh, a chain hoist and the an a frame to lift up the the top piece so I can lower it down because that top piece probably weighs about close to three hundred pounds and uh so uh it it becomes pretty uh pretty uh, involved as far as the the work. The yellow stone is um, is calcite from Utah, and I recently started doing uh, these uh, wall hangings, which I call um, my rain spirit uh, series, and I use turquoise as well as uh, parrot feathers, and these are items that you could uh, hang on the wall. Here's another uh, lamination plus construction. Um, I laminated the pedestal as well as the buffalo skull. And then I attached the buffalo skull to a, uh, a granite round flat um, uh, base. And then I attached that base to the pedestal. Here's a smaller version. But this is also a wall hanging. Now, um, with the lamination, it also allows me to, to create um, more abstract pieces. Uh, this one actually is titled Deco Bra Bracelet. Uh, I first did one bracelet, stone bracelet. It's it was probably about uh, 16 inches wide and probably about 10 inches tall. And I titled that, in my next life, I'm coming back as a jeweler. Maybe, maybe, uh, and, you know, because sculptors, we're, we're known to be the first ones at a show and then the last ones to leave because we've got to, you know, load, unload and set up and then load up. And so we're, we're you know, we, 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 we have to work hard in order to set our pieces up. But um, I wanted to uh, create 
uh, images uh, uh, and jewelry as sculptural form. And, and it's a start because, uh, I mean, I can envision um, pieces that would be five, six feet tall, you know, and, and become like lawn jewelry, you know. So anyway, being able to uh, laminate the stones together and then creating um, an image from that, uh, that lamination, it takes a lot of planning. Um, and, and so I got to ensure that, that uh, when I pin them, that uh, the pins are, are, are secure enough and then also uh, in a position so that I don't cut into it. And I have done that. I have uh, cut into the pins and there's no turning back. Uh, so what you got to do is you got to improvise. And I've, I've done where I, I would actually route out that area and then insert or inlay another stone. And, you know, and it, it, it works. But um, um, as I mentioned, it, it does take a lot of planning. Um, these turtles I did, uh, and here's another uh, boss. And, you know, one of my, one of my uh, inspiration is uh, Tony Day. I, um, when I was living in San Francisco, I actually seen some of his uh, pottery in magazines, and I was totally inspired. I was, I was so floored by what he was doing, and he was so way ahead of his time. Uh, but, you know, I never had a chance to meet him, uh, but I've always admired what he had done, and I just... Uh, and I, I wanted to see and honor him, you know, in stone. And this is one way of uh, of doing that. That's what I'm doing nowadays. I mean, I, I still occasionally um, do the one stone sculptures. Um, I also like to uh, incorporate the different colors of stones and create a scenario. Uh, sort of like a stage and I haven't done that in a while but uh, uh, there, there was a, a good body of work back uh, about maybe 15 about 15 years ago um, but uh, I still have that in the back of my head and what I um, what I handed out is, uh, first of all, my bio sheet. Uh, and then in the back, you'll see the uh, sculpture of Pope A. It, it's the black and white, which is uh, my bio sheet. And in the back, um, there's a photograph of Pope A, and that's uh, at the National Statuary Hall in Washington, D.C. I was commissioned by the state of New Mexico to do that piece. And, um, and it was installed in 2005, uh, and it was quite an event. I mean, the, the, whole, uh, the whole time of the commission was quite an event. You know, it, uh, it involved um, the decision making, it involved the, the actual structure of the organization to, to, uh, to place the sculpture in Washington, D.C. It involved the, um, the, the, the Pueblos, the, the, the culture of the Pueblos. It also involved the traditional uh, religious part of our, of our culture. Um, and, and so it, it became really complex. Um, but I was honored to be able to, to create this culture. I was honored to be selected and to represent uh, the Pueblo nations. And so I um, um, uh, finished the piece in uh, 2005. I don't know how many <laughs> blessings we had of the stone. Uh, there was blessings when, uh, when we had the stone shipped from Tennessee, uh, state of Tennessee, to New Mexico. We blessed it when it arrived. Uh, we blessed it before we started. Before I started carving it, 
and then uh, we blessed it again to sh uh, take it to San Juan Pueblo or Oke okay, Wingate, and then and then we blessed it again to send it to Washington D.C. And then when we had the unveiling, it was blessed again. So there's just so many blessings, but it was uh, it was quite a uh, it was quite fun actually, because uh, everybody had a chance to come and and touch the stone and some some of the more important dignitaries, so to speak, had a chance to to uh, to uh, chisel the stone and um, and 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 the unveiling we had I don't know, anywhere from three close to four hundred people there who were from New Mexico and uh, uh, it, it was just it was just so so neat. We started uh, the procession from um, the Museum of the American Indian, and just before we were about to take the to do the procession, somebody had noticed there was an eagle flying around uh, above us, and it's quite unusual because in in Washington D.C. it's uh, eagles are rare, but that day there was an eagle flying above us. And so they, we all took that as a blessing. Uh, it was a sign. So, so that started our procession. Then we got to the rotunda of the Capitol building, and um, and then we, um, uh, uh, you know, did the formalities and and the, the blessings, the dances, the prayers, and uh, it was quite fun. It was it was, it was quite an, uh, an event. And, um, and I felt really honored. Um, but it also is um, educating people, uh, people of the United States as well as people from all over the world, about our culture, uh, the Pueblo people. And, uh, and, and so when people see the sculpture, you know, they'll ask questions and maybe do some research. But... Um, there, there was some controversy uh, uh, that came along with that commission. Uh, some people were against it because of, uh, because, you know, um, because of the revolt that occurred and and, and the ones that were that were um, were killed in, in the revolt. So that that con controversy came up. But one of the things that I Excluded uh, in that particular piece there in Washington D.C. was the reason why we had to revolt, and so uh, I created a second rendition of uh, Pope A, which is the second sheet that you have there, and currently it's at the uh, Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, and and what I included in that piece was the reason why the revolt happened. And there was, uh, at the bottom at his feet, is a crucifix that's been broken in half. And uh, it's placed there um, so that people will ask questions about why is there a broken crucifix. And then the, the cultural center will answer their questions. And, and so, um, it hasn't been much of a controversy. I think people understand that, which is good, because now people are, are more open to, to what has occurred in the past, and they're open to our views as Pueblo people. And so uh, you know, I wanted to share that with you, and if you ever have a chance to go down to the, to the uh, Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, it's right there at the south entrance in the rotunda, and it's actually a part of the uh, uh, exhibition there, the 100-year um, federal and state policy uh, uh, in Pueblo country. Uh, it's an exhibition that, uh, um, that uh, uh, teaches about um, our dealings with the federal and state government, as well as... Uh, um, with other governments, and there's some areas where the uh, 
the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty is uh, um, uh, there to, to educate people about how government to government works, you know, with the Pueblo people. So it's an interesting uh, exhibition. I, and I was part of that um, uh, committee to uh, put all of, of that uh, exhibition together. And, and when they needed a, an introdu introductory piece, um, we went round and round, and, uh, and we had ideals, and, and, but eventually it just you know, it started falling apart, and then I, 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 had, I told them that I have this second edition of Pope A, if they like to see it. And when they saw it, they just like totally said, yes, this is it, this is what we need. So I included it in the, uh, in the exhibition. And so the cultural center is working to install it permanently. So if you get a chance, go by and check it out. But um, anyway, um, I'm open to questions if anybody has any. Sir? Well, you, to, to join the different pieces, you have pins. Yeah. Then would you epoxy it also? Yes, I epoxy it. Yeah, I, you have to use a certain um, type of uh, consistency. Um, with the epoxy, there's three grades. One is called knife grade, and it's, uh, it's pasty, it's, it's thick. Uh, another consistency is uh, flowing, and it's sort of like the honey consistency. And then the third grade is, um, is water. And it's a very thin, um, it's a very thin, uh, uh, runny type of uh, epoxy. What I use is flowing, because what it does is it, it allows the air bubbles to to seep seep out. Because uh, if I use a knife grade, then it, it has a tendency to form air bubbles, and uh, and so I use that with the pinning. Any other questions? Um, Yes, a piece, a piece like this, you carved the, the eagle uh, in marble. What was it? Was it with chisels? Was it using you know, yeah, electric, electric chisel, or is it a hand, hand chiseling job? Actually, um, nowadays I use a lot of grinders. I I have diamond attachments, and generally they're about four inches in, uh, in diameter. I just attach them to a handheld grinder. And then I'll just grind the shape, or I'll cut the shape. Then I'll use another grinder with a with a, a diamond facing. And then I'll grind that, and then uh, then we um, have to uh, shape it with uh, with carbide or diamond files, and then uh, then hand sand it. Um, and I do have chisels as well as air hammers, but it's been a while since I've used that, um, and it's great for uh, smaller details uh, or when you need to get to a certain spot or area. Um, I used to use it all the time, but I, I find um, using uh, grinders a lot quicker. And I, I also have die grinders, they're like large Dremels. And I attach the uh, mounted points, and so the mounted points can either be um, silicon carbide, which is good for stone, or diamond tip. And I, I would actually just carve out all the details with with the die grinders, and I'll use Dremels too to get the finer details. So grinding is more really more effective and efficient than than chipping. Yeah, so yeah, for me it is. Uh, I will on occasions break out the air hammer or the the chisels or even the hand chisels, uh, but um, it's been rare, you know, uh, lately. Yeah. But you're working in a cloud of stone dust. I do, I do. I you know, and I also teach at uh, at uh, various workshops, marble uh, workshops around the country, and uh, and yes. You know, safety is is a is a big uh, presentation in those uh, those uh, workshop. Um, the use of um, dust masks and uh, 
eye protection as well as hearing is, uh, is, is stressed at these workshops. But I always tell people, do as we say, not as we do. <laughs> because uh, for, some, uh, for some stones, it's, it's safe, uh, particularly with the lighter color marbles. Um, they're, they're calcium carbonate, which, you know, which your body will absorb. But then the darker the marble, the more magnesium it contains. So you have to be careful of that. And so when, when I grind, I make sure I grind outside and I make sure that the wind is behind me and so the dust is blowing away from me. Uh, on occasions when, um, when I'm in an area where the, the dust isn't going anywhere, yeah, I'll, I'll put on the mask. Uh, so yeah, it, it's it's real important, and you always have to worry about the flying chips too, because sometimes those chips are minute, and then if it gets in your eye, it can be really irritating, and so you got to take care of that as well. I have I have this at the studio. I have tons and tons of stone. <laughs> <laughs> I but I need to take it down to you know, one of the stone yards and have them cut it, but. Once again, it all has to do with planning. What do you need to have cut? What do you need as far as producing an image? So there, there's that planning. When I was doing sculptures uh, just on one stone, it was more spontaneous. And it's, it's a technique that they call direct carving. You just carve right into the stone, and then whatever image emerges out of it, then you would you would uh, work with that image. Uh, some people do drawings, and occasions I do drawings, but then I have to wait for the stone that will, that will take the drawing. Um, uh, so, um, for a lot of sculptors, direct carving is just much easier. Uh, and because I believe that stone is a living entity, that it does have its own spirit, and that you have to work with stone um, in order to get a final uh, finish. Uh, because there's been a lot of times, and this is my first lesson actually. Um, uh, Mr. Hauser said, you know, you guys go ahead and pick out your stone and work on the image. and. Uh, and uh, you know I'll be around to help you out. And so I took this piece of uh, uh, soapstone, and I was looking at it, and, oh, and I, I started doing my drawing, and, and then on paper, and then I put it on stone, and, and then I started carving it, and I was just really, I was just so into, I, mean, I was so involved in getting it finished, and 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 and. Uh, and you know, astounding the art world, you know. <laughs> and then about, about a couple of hours into carving, the stone breaks in half, you know. <laughs> now I think, oh God, so much for astounding the art world. <laughs> so I, I took one of the pieces and I was just turning it around. And, and I just took a file and I just started filing just to kind of get the feel of the stone. And, and eventually I saw an image. And so I... And really worked at it, and, and it was just a small bear, you know. And I, I thought this is really cool, but it wasn't until years later when I realized that it was a, it was a lesson. The important thing was be humble, and so uh, it, it, it's taught me a lot, actually. Uh, it's, it, it's been a teacher. Um, I, you know, when when you start out. Um, as an artist, you, you think you are in control, but it's actually your material that controls you. you you're just an extension of your material. And so I tell people that I am what the stone wants to become. Um, I'm only there to help the stone become what it wants to be. And then I'm also the mediator between the stone and the people, the, the viewer. And so uh, I'm there to help translate, and, uh, and that's why I'm here.
and I appreciate your time. So if, you have, if there's any other questions, yeah. What's the, what was the yellow spell? Oh, that, that was a calcite. Uh, calcite from uh, Utah. It's quarried, um, yeah, let's see. It's quarried in uh, around the Park City, Utah area. That, that yellow? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it has the same hardness as marble. Um, but it's, it's also a, a fragile stone, meaning that if it's left outdoors, um, the color and this brilliance will fade. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marvelous stone, but you don't want to place it outdoors. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's actually a large uh, vein. It's a large quarry. And um, uh, so they extract really large boulders. And, uh, but it, has, uh, it comes in white, uh, and it also comes in um, sort of like a, uh, a brownish color and yellow. Um, there, there's some uh, calcite that's quarried here in New Mexico, but it's more of a brownish uh, color. And then there's calcite that also is from uh, Argentina. Uh, it's, uh, it's this one here. It, uh, it's quarried in the Andes Mountains, so uh, when they sell it on the market, it's really expensive. And they, they generally sell stones by the pound, and they can go from anywhere from a dollar a pound up to, uh, with that one, it's like three eighty-five a pound. And some Belgian marble, uh, because the Belgian marble uh, quarry has closed, now sell for about five dollars a pound, and and one cubic foot of marble weighs one hundred and eighty pounds. <laughs> yeah, so you want to use your material well. <laughs> you want to talk to the stone. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you.